Today's Innovation Bite stems from a fantastic Harvard Business Review article by today's guest. Don't let hierarchy stifle innovation. It always happens. It happens in every legacy organization. Once that organization is established and authority is established, the organization is liable to this bias. It is a great pleasure to welcome back the author of that article and a fantastic series we had a few months ago on the Innovation Show on his book, The Four Stages of Psychological Safety. Tim Clark, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Aidan. Good to be here. Thank you. In your research with hundreds of teams over decades, you have identified a cultural barrier that stifles innovation, hence the title of the article. And in its earliest stage, it's authority bias. And the quote that I pulled to tee you up here, Tim, is in the team sport of innovation, the quality of interaction between teammates regulates the speed of discovery. If a team is healthy, the pattern of exchange will be free flowing, candid and energized. If it's unhealthy, the team will re retreat into silence, superficial niceness or some combination of the two. Beautifully put. Hopefully that tees you up. Over to you. Thanks, Aiden. Yeah, so let's come back to the premise. It's a very important premise for people to understand. The pattern of interaction regulates the speed of discovery. Now you have to you have to pause and ponder and think about that for a minute. So think about your team, think about your organization. The pattern of interaction regulates the speed of discovery. Now, what does hierarchy have to do with this? As Aiden, as you said, hierarchy gets in the way. Hierarchy has an inherent liability. Now, we need hierarchy. We're not going to get rid of hierarchy. We need it for division of labor, roles and responsibilities, so that we can be organized and we can do our work. The liability is that over time, we develop what's called an authority bias, which means that we overvalue opinions from the top of the hierarchy, and we undervalue opinions from the bottom of the hierarchy. It gets to the point where we actually are looking at the source of an opinion or an idea or a suggestion or a point of view rather than the substance. And so what we're trying to do in organizations and what you need to do on your team is to create what we call cultural flatness. Cultural flatness is the way that we neutralize the liability of hierarchy. And what is that hierarchy? To breed authority bias. So again, let me just restate it. So authority bias in different words is an exaggerated deference to the chain of command. Why? Because there's a power differential. If you have positional power and I don't, then there's going to be, I, I may be deeply socialized to defer to you, but do you see the problem when it comes to innovation? That's not going to help anybody. So cultural flatness is a condition where we become very agnostic to title and position and authority. We, we, we clear the decks of that so that we can really debate issues on their merits really create an idea of meritocracy. So for all the listeners out there, I would just urge you to think about, do you have authority bias on your team? Do you see exaggerated deference to the chain of command? Do you see people uh, deferring, agreeing, or perhaps recoiling and withdrawing because of the power differential? If so, you've got work to do. You've got work to do to create cultural flatness to neutralize that liability. So Aiden, that's what it is. Let's not leave our audience hanging, Tim. Let's give them a couple of ways that they can neutralize authority bias within an organization. So they have some solutions at least to lean into. Yeah, so um, there, there are very practical things that, that you can do as a member of the team or as a leader. The first one, is, as I say, is to grant irrevocable participation rights. Now, let's just spend a minute on that. We need to make a distinction between participation rights 
and decision rights. The difference is very important. Participation rights means that I can weigh in with a point of view, an opinion, a suggestion, some analysis. That's, that's, I can participate. Those are my participation rights. Decision rights are different. Decision rights says someone or some group of people, they have the authority to make the decision on this issue. Okay, that's fine. And usually that's based on role, responsibility, authority. Okay. So what we need to do is distinguish between the two and make sure, as I say, grant irrevocable participation rights. That means make sure that everybody knows that they have their participation rights and that they're encouraged to use those rights. And when they do, they'll be rewarded for it. And, and you can't ever take those away. Now, one of the examples that I give in the article, Aiden, is this woman came to me and she said, Tim, let me tell you how it works in our organization. You have to listen for a year before we listen to you. I said, excuse me? I said, really? She said, yeah, that's how it works. Now, I want you to just pause and think about that for a minute. We have to, we have to listen. We, you have to listen for a year before we will listen to you. How can you innovate in that kind of an environment? So we're not going to give you any participation rights until you earn them. What I'm saying is you don't earn your participation rights. You get them on day one because we brought you into the organization. Why else would we bring you into the organization to then silence you? It makes no sense. So that crucial distinction between participation rights and decision rights is sometimes blurry and ambiguous and confusing in organizations. Get that clear and make sure that people understand that they have their participation rights, which by the way, includes a license to disagree and that you're encouraged to, to use those rights. So Aiden, that's, that's probably the, the, the big one that I'd like to focus on. That's so huge. It sparks to mind that you, when somebody joins an organization and the brain works this way as well, it becomes used to the way things are done around here. And I think you have this very small window to be able to spot things that are, don't work for an organization, including opportunities as well as threats. And if you're shutting down the very people who can spot those, you can spot threats in the environment as well. And as you say, then you kind of have this where you join the organization, you're kind of going, I don't want to make too many waves too early because I might create enemies. But then on top of that, what you say, if I don't even have the right to participate, how is the organization ever going to get out of its legacy mindset? Exactly right. I mean, think about how you're stifling the organization. And then it makes sense that eventually you would create willful blindness in the organization because you're you're restricting people from using their participation rights. So that would make sense. So you're going to develop these blind spots and then that's going to increase and eventually you'll have, you'll, you'll be willfully blind. You'll lose your adaptive capacity as an organization and you'll be scratching your head and wondering why. Well, it began with these norms. It began with the fact that you were letting perhaps hierarchy get in the way. And Tim has other ways that we can neutralize authority bias within an organization. Highly recommend any of Tim's writing. He's on the Harvard Business Review, but I absolutely love his book. And we did a deep dive on his book. And even in that deep dive, didn't get near the amount of content in the four stages of psychological safety. Go to Tim's site as well. Tim, let's tell people where they can find you, find out more about you, booking you as a keynote speaker, booking your team to come into organizations to be able to neutralize authority bias among a wide range of other services. Oh, we'd love to see you at leaderfactor.com. That's our website. And then feel free to reach out uh, to me on LinkedIn. Uh, Timothy R. Clark, love to hear from you. Tim Clark author of The Four Stages of Psychological Safety and another plethora of books, I might add. Thank you for joining us. Thanks so much, Aiden.